From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Barry Winters at Masters Insurance and Trust. Oh, hi, Barry. It's been years. Sure, Johnny, because we don't usually have trouble with our accounts. You mean you didn't? Huh? Until now. Well, yeah, I'm afraid that's about the size of it. And this time, it's bad trouble. Tell me all. Simplex Tackle Company, Johnny, over in Danbury. Fishing tackle? That's right. Well, how come I never heard of them? Well, they're a small outfit, a kind of glorified partnership. What's that mean? Well, it's owned by nine men. One of them, Hanley Thomas, is president. The others are secretary, treasurer, and a flock of vice presidents. So what's happened? Well, the nine of them, plus the 20 or 30 workers at the plant, are all covered by a group life insurance deal. And listen. Yeah? We've just had to pay off on three policies in a row. Well, that's too bad. But why call on me? Because, Johnny. Why? Those three deaths were all murders. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Masters Insurance and Trust Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the ugly pattern matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even taxi to Barry Winter's office at Masters, where I hoped he could give me something more to work on than he had over the phone. And you know something? As it turned out, he gave me a lot more than he thought he did. The police? Sure, they've been working on these murders, Johnny, but they haven't come up with anything, except a theory that one man is behind them all. Why, Barry? Because the victims have all been members of the Simplex Tackle Company. Well, but I don't... Because they've all occurred within a month. Because each of them occurred on a Wednesday. Pattern, huh? That's right. And also, Johnny, because there's been no apparent reason for any of them. Uh-huh. Have the police found anything? Nothing. Hmm. Same kind of weapon used in each case? No. The first was a VP named Adams, run over by a car. Sure it wasn't accidental. The police say no. The second, John Bowers, was strangled, and Frank Dalvers was shot in his own home. No pattern there. I mean, in the way they occurred. Apparently not. But Hanley Thomas and the police don't agree. Thomas is president of Simplex, you said. And a real financial wizard. Used to be a promoter. Not much ethics, but a sharp businessman. As a friend or partner, I imagine he's... Well, he's a fine man. Here, here. I'll give you a complete list of the officers of the company, their rank and their salary. Well, I don't know exactly what good that'll be. Here you are. And this is a list of the employees. Have those employees all been checked out? Sergeant Dennis over there at Homicide made quite a point of it. So did Mr. Thomas. Well, look, why don't I run over there and talk with him and to the Danbury police? Yeah, I think you'd better. And, Johnny, the sooner the better. Why do you say that? The pattern. There are still six officers left in that company. That is, six who are still alive. Item two, another buck for a cab back to my apartment. There I picked up my own car, and from here on in, the charge will be for mileage. Except for item three, four and a quarter for a tank of mobile gas. It was almost noon by the time I'd covered the 60-odd miles to the Simplex factory on the far edge of Danbury. To my surprise, it was quite a plant, new and modern in every way. A receptionist took my card, and a few minutes later, I was ushered into the office of Hanley Thomas, president. Oh, this is a terrible thing. Adams, Bowers, Frank Dalvers, all within a few weeks. Barry Winters, back in Hartford, seems to think these murders have all been the work of one man. Mm, Police and I concur in that theory. There's been a sort of pattern followed by the crazy killer. But not an actual method, Mr. Thomas. No, no, I'll grant you that's true. Car accident, strangling, pistol shot. But they were done by someone who must have been very familiar with his victims. How do you mean? Well, someone who knew, for instance, that Ben Adams took a long walk alone each night. He knew the route that he took. Same thing applied to the second victim? John Bowers always drove to work through a little woods. It was there he was stopped and strangled. Frank Dalvers always stayed at home alone on Wednesday nights while his wife was out playing bridge. Someone broke in on him, huh? Have the police checked that? Well, it was someone he must have let in. In other words, someone he knew. Mm, That's a possibility, I suppose. 
I understand you've checked on all your employees. Yes, right off the bat, as much as we... Or rather, as much as the police could. Any particular reason to suspect one of them? Well, only because they were all in position to know these men pretty well. Know their habits. We're a small company, Mr. Dollar. Our employees, including the girls in the office, only number 21. That was your only reason to think one of them may have done it? Oh, of course, we've had our share of labor troubles. A few dissidents in the ranks, so to speak... I suppose some of them resent the rather top-heavy management here. You mean the fact there are nine executives to only 21 employees, huh? Yes. And I must confess, the profits have been pretty good lately. Barry Winters gave me a list of, uh... Oh, here it is. Now, according to this, all of these... What is it, Mr. Dollar? Well, I, I got thinking on the way over here. Yes? Part of the pattern you mentioned, the three men were killed in, well, in alphabetical order. What? Well, yes. Adams, Bowers, Dalvers. But now that I look at this list again... Of course. The pattern again. No, no, I think that was just coincidence. The pattern, if there is one, is based on their order of rank. That is, if these salary figures mean anything. Well, I'm not sure I understand Well, you. look, first was Adams at the lowest salary among you officers. Oh, well, yes. Adams received 12000 a year. Yeah, look... Bowers came in next at thirteen five. You're right. And Frank Dalvers earned fifteen thousand. So if this pattern should continue. You 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 mean to say you think there might be more of these murders? If this pattern continues, the next to go would be Good heavens. Would be James Williams or Charles Hart. Both earning sixteen five. Then a couple of more. Then you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Dolly. Where'll I find James Williams? Why? Well, Williams is on vacation, a little place not far from here, Parvin's Pond. When did he leave? Last week, on Monday. Have you heard from him? No, no, I haven't, but... Of course, if the alphabetical pattern is the right theory... Oh, excuse me. Yes? Sergeant Dennis, Mr. Thomas. Oh, it's a sergeant at homicide, Mr. Dollar. So I hear. I'll hold the phone so you can Mr. get ready. Mr. Thomas. Say. Uh, yes, Sergeant. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. Oh? Another one of your partners. Williams. Mr. John Williams. Yes, Discovered his body over at Parvin's Pond this morning. He's been murdered. Good Lord. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ugly pattern matter. Another of the executives of the Simplex Tackle Company murdered, bludgeoned to death in his little vacation cabin on Parvin's Pond, some 40 miles north of Danbury. And again, it was according to pattern. How those carefree kids confession water ski out there when there's been a murder right under their noses? Yes, yeah, Sergeant, I know what you mean. This the cabin Mr. Williams was using? Yes, sir. He came up here on his vacation Monday morning last week alone. There, there we are. Who knew he was coming to this particular spot, Sergeant? Why, everybody down at the plant, I guess. Now, the way the doc and I figured it out, Mr. Williams had just come in from fishing. Now, you see there, he just tossed his rod and stringer on the bed. Uh, everything's just the way it was, huh? Except for his body. That's in Danbury at the coroner's. You said he was bludgeoned to death. Now, with that oar from his rowboat. You see it uh, laying there on the floor? Yeah, I see. Who found his body? Little old lady from the cabin next door. She'd stopped by this morning to bring him some cookies. Knocked on the door, the door swung open, and there he was. And the doc says the body was lying there ever since. Have you checked that oar for prints? The killer must have used gloves. What about footprints? Well, if there were any, the vacation crowd tramped them out long before we got here. Now, the way we figure is that he came in here Wednesday night, off the lake. Wednesday? Yes, Mr. Dollar, just like the other ones. It happened on Wednesday. A week ago tomorrow. The pattern again. Yes, sir. And if you ask me, it's the pattern of a madman. And this being a Tuesday but again... But what possible motive could there be for it? When you ask me, it's one of the employees there at the plant. After all, for such a small company, nine big money-making officers, at least there was nine. Yeah, I know what you mean. Are those 21 employees paid pretty well? No. Nope. In spite of the company making a lot of money. What with this recession we're no, in... i read the signs, man. Most of this so-called recession's a lot of bunk. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Everybody get out and dig instead of sitting around hoarding their money. Well, what I was going to say is that those executives took advantage and held down wages in spite of all the money they're making. 
So just let one crazy hothead find out how good they're doing. How well have you checked those employees? The best we could. I talked with every one of them myself. How about the officers of the company? There's not one of them would do a thing like that. They're all fine men. Ask Mr. Thomas. Sure, they're hard-headed businessmen. Everyone looking out for himself, but they're all fine men. And they're all making plenty of money. Oh, which reminds me. Hmm? Uh, what's that, Mr. Dollar? A list of the officers and their salaries. And according to this, if there's to be another victim... Another? Oh, no. I worked out another step in the pattern of these murders based on the earnings of these men. Then, Mr. Dollar, who will it be? It won't be anybody if I can help it. But, Sergeant, I may have to ask you to put a 24-hour watch over an officer of that company named Mr. Charles Hart. I didn't bother explaining my own idea of the pattern to Sergeant Dennis. After all, my theory could be wrong. But I drove back to the Simplex factory, to the office of Charles Hart. I found only a secretary there. No, he isn't here, Mr. Dollar. Well, where is he? To be perfectly honest about it, I don't know. Hasn't he been in at all today? No, sir. Hasn't been in since about last Wednesday. Look, Miss, uh, Miss, uh, whatever your name is, have you called his home, his wife? He's a bachelor, Mr. Dollar, and lives in a little apartment in Danbury. Have you tried to call him? Well, no, sir. You see, there was Does no... Does Mr. Thomas know about his not being here? There's nothing unusual about Charlie's leaving without telling us, Mr. Dollar. Oh, Mr. Thomas. He often goes off on sales trips like this. He was last seen the day Mr. Williams was killed. Well, surely you don't think Charlie Hart had anything to do with Jim Williams being... Oh, no. Did, did you find out anything over at Parvin's Pond? No, not much, I'm afraid. Could this Charlie Hart have had any reason for wanting Williams out of the organization and Adams and Bowers and Dalvers? Of course not. Yes. Yes, he could. What? Miss Gregg. What do you mean by that? Mr. Hart was the one who built up this company. The one who developed the products, put all his money in now, it. Now, just a minute. He's the one who sold all the products that made all the money. He and Mr. Adams were the ones who started the business. Is that true, Mr. Thomas? Yes, of course. And when Mr. Thomas and his relatives came along... Miss with... Gregg! What she says is true, Mr. Dollar. Charlie Hart and Ben Adams did start this business. They took on a couple of partners, Al Bowers and Frank Dalvers. They were the ones who decided on the expansion program who came to us for the financing. But the other's gone. It should have been Mr. Hart's company. Oh, wait, Miss Craig. Our financing made this present operation possible. But to imply that Charlie could have been driven by jealousy or, well, or any other motive to commit these crimes, that's absurd. How could you suggest such a thing, Miss Craig? I didn't say he did it. I only tried We know to... what you said, and you've said enough. Tell me one thing, Mr. Thomas. Yes? What happens to his share of the business when one of the partners dies? Or in this case... When he's murdered. What? The other partners absorb his share. Then, if Charlie Hart eliminated one of you, it would add to his holdings. That's true. Okay, I'll see you later. But, Mr. Dollar, if you believe for one moment that Charlie Hart... Why, I've known him for years. Yeah? Well, I think I want to know him a little better. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said... Democracy is based upon the conviction that there are extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people. Those words came from the American religious leader, Harry Emerson Fosdick. From the earliest days of the United States of America, there has been the sentiment that the average person can achieve an important goal if he is given an environment in which he can develop his capabilities to the fullest extent. An environment in which the individual is given the rights and privileges that he needs for development. It is the duty of every American to protect and stimulate this environment. Remember the words of Harry Emerson Fosdick. They are part of your American heritage. The extraordinary possibilities of ordinary people are inherent in American democracy. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Ugly Pattern Matter. It was pretty plain that Charlie Hart, supposedly next on the list of victims, had plenty of motive for eliminating some of his partners in the Simplex Tackle Company. I guess the same applied to any other member of the company. But he, having started the business, knew all about the others, their plans, their habits. And he'd been last seen just prior to the murder of James Williams. I got his address, hopped into my car, and drove back to Danbury. But ringing his bell and pounding on his door got me nothing. Here, here, young man. You want 
Mr. Hart who probably find him at the factory. Are you the building superintendent? That's right. Then I want you to let me into Mr. Hart's apartment. Well, now. All right, here. Here are my credentials. I'm an insurance investigator. Investigator? Yeah, here, see? Johnny Dollar, special. And if that isn't enough, here's a five spot for your trouble. Ten. Well. But now don't you let on. That okay, I... Dad, thanks. Same list that I got. The office. Huh? The office is of our company. Mr. Hart. That's right, Charlie Hart. Should have looked behind the door and you barged in here. Yeah, well, look. Would you like to point that thing the other way, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, of course. Well, you know who I am? Yes, yes, I heard you through the door. All right, is that the gun that killed one of your partners? That killed one of my... No. But listen. Tomorrow's another Wednesday. Wednesday, Mr. Dollar. I know. And look. Look at that list you're holding. I finally realized the progression in which these murders are happening. Oh. On on the basis of our salaries at the company. Adams, Bowers, Dulvers, and Williams or me. Yes, you've circled Williams' name. Yes, because he got it last week. That's why I'm staying in here, locked in. Because tomorrow, if the killer strikes again, that crazy maniac killer... Maybe. Or maybe that's what he'd like everyone to think. Charlie, a couple of questions. Anything, anything, if I can help you stop this. That company was once yours. Yes, that's right. You were the boss, the head man, until Hanley Thomas came along. Yes, Hanley and his brothers and his brother-in-law. And they took over as first in rank. Well, they were entitled to, Dollar. What? It was their money made the company what it is. I- I'm not an administrator, a-, a man who knows and plays all the angles. I'm, I'm just a worker and a salesman. Oh, now, wait a minute. You mean you... You're content with the present setup? Yes, yes, of course. (laughs) In spite of the prodding of a sweet old secretary who thinks that I... Wait a minute. But these murders, Mr. Dollar. You stay put. Keep that gun and don't move out of this apartment until I tell you to, no matter who comes to the door, to save your life. You think you know... Charlie, it's been right under my nose. The obvious. Almost too obvious. But I had no proof of anything. Only a hunch, but a potent one. So how to prove it out? Bluff? It might work. If I was right. I drove into police headquarters and picked up Sergeant Dennis, then out to the Simplex Tackle Company. But when I walked in, it was after hours, no secretaries about. When I walked into the office, I borrowed the sergeant's handcuffs and made him wait outside as he had glued to the door. Well, Mr. Dollar, I didn't expect you back, sir. <laughs> what do the handcuffs mean? They mean arrest for the murder of your partners? That's a very bad joke. You and your brothers and brother-in-law, the whole company yours, once you got rid of the men who started it, who made it possible for your capital to make it pay off. But tell me, were you going to kill off your relatives, too, one by one? This is the most absurd you thing. You covered your tracks pretty well. Perfect crimes, except for that ore you used to kill Williams. Fingerprints as big as life all over it. Impossible. I figured the gloves you wore must have had holes in them or have been worn very thin. What? That you just didn't notice in the excitement of the moment. And when I finally found those gloves... You've been out to my home, ransacking my home. And when your home? wife confessed that you weren't at home at the time of any of the murders... That's a lie. She helped me plan the whole thing. Oh. Then you admit the murders. After my bluff about the fingerprint. I see. But now that you know, and you haven't had time to tell anyone... Uh, there's no one around to hear the shot, Mr. Dollar. No, oh, but I heard a real clean uh, confession, Mr. Thomas. Sergeant, I... I no, no, that, that was just to protect myself from this, this... I'm afraid that kind of talk's a little late. No, no, it is. Look out! Sergeant, I haven't seen that fast a draw except on TV. That's where I learned it. There'll be a lot for the courts to work on about who else was involved with Thomas... The sergeant's bullet killed him, by the way, and I'd call it good riddance, or at least quick justice. So, expense account total, including a lot of mileage on my car, $101 even. Remarks? Why bother? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours 
truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Les Tremaine, Forrest Lewis, Herb Vigran, Junius Matthews, and Frank Gerstle. Be sure to join us next week for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.